not the people. Israel, the Zionist state, and Saudi Arabia, which pretend to be the, uh, through Wahhabism, the renovator of Islam and so on. They are the best allies of Israel, in fact. They are the best allies of the United States. Now, it's very funny to see now Saudi Arabia king appearing uh, as the defensor of, uh, of democracy in the Middle East, the most reactionary autocratic regime, uh, that regime which uh, does not allow women even to drive a car, <laughs> uh, even to drive a car, uh, is appearing or presenting itself as a defensor of democracy uh, in the Middle East. Yeah, I think it's very important how you bring sort of human agency and politics to our understanding of religion and you remove it from an essentialized understanding of what of, of the way in which often the US presents it as a clash of cultures yes. and divisions. And I also think how you do this to your understanding of development and emancipation, which takes me to also the question of democracy. So the reimagining of democracy and its frontiers through people's practice. Yes, so you see, I'm always, I'm trying to avoid the word democracy mm -hmm. because it is uh, most often reduced to a blueprint that is pluripartism and elections, pluripartism and elections. Uh, and instead of speaking of democracy, I'm speaking of democratization of the society, which is an endless process. We have not come to the end of this. Uh, uh, I don't consider United States or Britain or France or Germany as democracies. Well, they are perhaps a little more advanced than, uh, than Saudi Arabia, <laughs> uh, that, that is easy, but it's not the end of the process. The democratization of the society, and I, I come back to what I said before, that is the democratization of the society cannot be dissociated from social progress, progress to towards equality. There's the question of the democratization of the traditional left, because you've written about how old models, the vanguardist model of the political party, in many ways don't fit this historical period. So what forms of organization do you think do fit this historical yes. period? You see, we have to look at the left as also historical left. Uh, the left is not something pure and perfect which comes from the sky down, uh, to inspire people, it is the product of the struggles of the people. And it, it has the, li the limits of the uh, societies in which it develops. So the left is, not, is never perfect. It's always better than the right, but it's never perfect. So if we look at the historical left, whether the communist left of the, uh, uh, and the really existing socialisms uh, or the social democrat left of Western Europe, or the national popular left of Nasserism, uh, Boumedien, uh, and others in the Arab world, or the left today, uh, or in, in, as it is in uh, Venezuela or in Bolivia, is not the perfection, it's not the end of, of history. So we can see after... Uh, after, you know, history uh, operates through waves. And during a wave, a, a long period, things are achieved, but they have their own limits and contradiction. And therefore, the left, which have been able to achieve a number of things, comes to uh, losing its, uh, its uh, breath and get eroded and, uh, uh, and break down. Hmm? We have had that. Uh, many, many times, con continuously, constantly in history. Uh, we, and, and therefore, it is easy for us today to see the limits of what was the left yesterday. Uh, and we have to take it into account by recreating a left which corresponds to the new conditions of history, to the new pattern of organization of societies, to the new level of consciousness of the challenges and level of demands. For instance, uh, the, um, the feminist dimension was not terribly 
taken into account a century ago, even in the European so-called most advanced societies. Uh, it did not appear at that time as being an important problem. But now, fortunately, it does appear. So that dimension in the new organization of the left will be, is, and, and should be, and will be taken into account much better than it was a century ago. I don't believe that we'll achieve that in a perfect way uh, within a few, it's not, you know, uh, uh, trying to, to have the good blueprint and sell it. Huh? Do that and it will be perfect. The people, through their struggle, invent. Hmm? Yes, so I'm really fascinated by this idea of that we invent, the people invent what it means to think about being on the left, what it means to have anti-capitalist struggle. So do you think then, therefore, we're in a period where we can't talk about one project of emancipating reason, one project of completing modernity, but that we have to talk about a plurality of projects? Yeah, yes, but be careful. The plurality of means, but um, universality of the target. The target is the emancipation of all humankind, men and women, Europeans and Africans, uh, big and small nations, etc. Uh, the target is emancipation. It involves the emancipation of the individual and of the communities, of the collectives. Um, you see, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the idea that the individual has been liberated by capitalism is completely uh, wrong has nothing to do with reality. The individual has been completely uh, subordinated to commodification, alienation, and so on. Uh, so it's a false independence of the individu in individual. Individual is not uh, yet emancipating, emancipated, but also the collectives. But the ways and means to get there uh, cannot be a blueprint similar for everybody everywhere because the objective conditions are different. Uh, you have, uh, you have uh, uh, patterns of power system, patterns of relations of production, which are all of them integrating in a global system of exploitation and oppression, but with uh, differentials, among other things, the, uh, con the, the contradiction, the conflict between what is being called the North and the South, which means the imperialist centers of the global system, the triad, US, Europe, and Japan, and the peripheries. And if you look at the peripheries, you have enormous gigantic countries, continental countries, like China, India, Brazil, and smaller countries. Uh, and you have uh, countries which are fairly advanced in industrialization to the extent that they are competitive on a global capitalist market like China, for instance, or to a lesser degree, uh, India or Brazil. Uh, and you have countries which have uh, hardly moved into industrialization as the majority of countries of, uh, of, 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 of Africa uh, as uh, as uh, a number of countries in Latin America, such as Bolivia, for instance, or Ecuador. Eh? So uh, the, uh, uh, the ways and means to move in that direction cannot be a blueprint the same for everybody. And in that sense, we, we, the, uh, people being inventive means that they, would, they will invent, they can invent the uh, strategies which will... Uh, uh, allow them to move in, in that direction. But also that, it, that would imply that there are, to some extent, different contents, because what it sounds like you're suggesting is a universalism in an ethical commitment to an emancipation in all levels of our lives, no. or see, not. I am universalist, but I am not Eurocentric. I don't think that Europe has already reached that point. It has not. And that and that, therefore, the model of what has been achieved in Europe being perfect should be copied by the others. Uh, Europe is no... Europe and United States are not much more advanced than the others in that. 
they are also oppressed, also dominated by capital, also alienated. And, and therefore, there is no European model to copy elsewhere. Uh, but the Europeans are human beings as the others. They are able also to invent. We, are, we have not the monopoly for the capacity to invent the future. I'd also, but I'd also say something more that, or from the Latin American experience, many of the inventions around how we might develop democracy as a participatory form of democracy that involves the economic, the social, the political. Um, there are lessons to be learned, I think, here. So I'd be quite interested to see what sort of lessons you think of could course. be. No, of course, there are always lessons to be learned from everywhere to everywhere. I mean, we have to learn from Europe. Europe have a, has to learn from Latin America. We Arabs have to learn from Latin America. The Latin American perhaps would have something to learn, not today perhaps, but tomorrow from the Arabs and so on. So saying that we have to learn, of course, that, that is for me... Uh, but would you like pinpoint particular things that you've seen in what's happening in the periphery, that particular tendencies or trends in the sort of reinvention of the left and of democratizing processes that we could bring or think about in this yes. context. You see, there are, there are many things uh, uh, to be learned from. Let, let us take the, the, the example of Bolivia. When the new regime uh, uh, declared that Bolivia is a plurinational, multinational state, uh, that was uh, uh, shocking to those who considered to the traditional vision of Bolivia a Latin American. And I was saying that Latin America should be called, in, uh, should be called Indo Afro Latin America because it has those three components. Uh, Brazil is not a Portuguese country, it's also a country with a very strong African. Uh, ingredient in its uh, uh, in its uh, fo historical formation, so uh, that that is an example. I, I, I see that in uh, Algeria there is a very the very st start beginning of understanding that Algeria considered officially Arab state, but now it uh, it is admitting that it and that does not reduce the uh, Algerian personality as such, that it is Arab, but it is Berber also. Hmm? And that these two components are reality, and they are not antagonistic. They reinforce one another. So we have always to, to learn from, uh, from experience. Yeah, this is a big problematic. So in some of the movements that have begun to blossom in the UK, um, around student uh, protests and around the Occupy uh, movement that you were at in Nottingham earlier today. Um, something that's interesting is the, is the prevalence to some extent of the liberal virus within those spaces, yeah. in the sense that there is very little under sense of history, of these experiences, of the theories that come from these experiences, and with that, often very little clarity of the future because there's this fetish of the present. So I suppose what sort of lessons and reflections would you give us about the role of historical patience and the role of time in our struggles and of learning from past theories and past experiences? I, I, I don't know what is going on actually in detail in, in Britain, so I cannot, uh, I would not allow myself to comment on things that I know. But I would give you again the Egyptian example. Uh, nine months ago, the common vision which most people shared, I would not put myself among those most people, was that the Egyptian people were depoliticized. And that was not completely wrong. It was not completely true, but not completely wrong. Within nine months, through the struggles, the level of consciousness and politicization has moved up dramatically and in the positive sense. I'm sure that through small actions, such as occupying uh, 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 schools or factories and so on, and through the debates, the discussion between the, the people, activists and, uh, and comrades and, and uh, 
citizens, the level of politicization is moving up. Yeah, oh, we do. <laughs> Although the UK context, I mean, there are differences across the globe, right? So the UK context is a difficult one because the, the state is relatively powerful. It's quite authoritarian tendencies. I, I think, yeah. It is difficult everywhere. Nowhere it is easy. Huh? And any idea that we shall reach uh, 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 important, uh, we, we shall achieve important victories uh, easily would be wrong. I think it's always difficult. You said earlier that you've been writing about democratizing education and the role of education. Yes. What would you understand to be the role of education in uh, an emancipatory project? I will. <laughs> I shall give you a paper on that. I was uh, writing a paper on the right to education. I was considering that the right to education is a fundamental basic human right. Uh, second, the right to educate, it's not the right to get an education, but to get the top and e education equally for all. Education is a, a, is a common good. And therefore, the target of uh, democratization of the society should be to provide maximal best education equally for all, which is not the case. We are, we are living in societies which are class societies, which are prejudiced, in which the elitist mentality is still dominant, and in which, therefore, education is considered as you have uh, top education, middle education, lower education, according to the people to whom um, uh, it is delivered. In the UK, obviously, we're having increasing austerity measures and the erosion of, of public goods, such as education and health and access to housing. And so some of the tendencies in the new politics that are arising are to try and collectively organise in society cooperatives in education, support for housing. Do you think this is a feasible strategy? I mean, how do you view that sort of strategy? Again, I, I, I don't want to sell you a blueprint of what you should do in Britain. But uh, for sure, Britain is not moving presently towards more democracy, but towards less democracy. And this is reflected not only in the austerity measures with respect to level of, uh, of wages and pensions, and, uh, and security in jobs and so on, but also to a, a, a growing inequality in education through, uh, through the uh, having education privatized, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, um, uh, covered by, uh, not covered by the public budget as equally as possible for all, but as unequally, is more and more unequal and, and through, uh, through fees and so on. So the, uh, but this is not particular to Britain. It is the tendency everywhere in the world today. Hmm? And this is one of the points which I'm raising in my paper, that education in the, in the present circumstances is not moving towards uh, fulfilling the right to education, but on the opposite, going in the opposite direction, towards denying the right to education to, uh, to, to the people. Because of the unevenness of the possibilities of a delinking strategy through the state, then perhaps it suggests that in certain contexts, the strategy should be to make parallel institutions. To make? And parallel yeah. institutions and not necessarily focus on a delinking through the state. So yeah, no, delinking is not only the state. Uh, first, I would say the linking starts in the head of the people by the linking, by getting, moving away from the liberal virus, and that is uh, 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 becoming conscious of uh, what is needed for them uh, to to to, uh, to get emancipated, and first emancipated from this liberal virus. So it's that. It's, that, that is not achieved through a, a, a state decision. It's not a decree of the president that uh, we should be uh, 
uh, we should be uh, emancipated. And then the next day the citizens are. It is a conquest. And this conquest is done uh, through struggle, uh, a variety of struggles, including ide uh, ideological struggle, including uh, uh, social struggles, including struggles for um, uh, democratization, which is always uh, uh, bits and parts. Huh? On, on, on the gender issue, on uh, some ecological issue here, on uh, another issue there, the right to, uh, to have a, a security job, etc., etc. Hmm? Yeah. There's something also that is very difficult, is that often the liberal virus and sort of neoliberal globalised capital is very much about immediate gratification. Yes. And so often one of the problems that you have in movements is that because there are not immediate results, people become very disillusioned and disappointed. So yes. would you give us any sort of thoughts on the whole idea of historical patience and time? Yes, the yes. Reflection on that? Well, it is easy for somebody of my age and who is not uh, particularly poor, uh, have not, I'm not suffering of poverty, to... to, to ask the people to be patient. But I can understand that somebody who is, uh, uh, has no home, uh, who is, uh, has no job, uh, cannot be uh, patient. He, uh, uh, and he struggles for changing at least that immediately, as fast as possible, through struggle is perfectly legitimate. So we have to be, uh, but we have to know also that um, <clears throat> Uh, small victories are very important um, because uh, the people need to see that uh, the struggle and fighting pays. Well, the result can be very modest, but it's very good for the morale that uh, the struggle pays. And that means that for those who have some responsibility in, I would not say conducting the struggles, but in associating themselves with, with the struggles, be, um, be cautious not to lead people to, uh, to defeat. Hmm? So um, we'd like to thank you for a fascinating thank discussion. You, it's you. been thank wonderful you. and uh, very informative. Thank you. thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you for your magazine <laughs> and for all the uh, uh, friends who will... Uh, uh, perhaps see it and listen to it. Thank you.